How to fail at fitting in. When I was four, my family moved to Northern Ireland. It was 1982 and the height of the Troubles. Bombs routinely exploded in shopping centres and hotel lobbies. On the school run, my mother would be stopped at checkpoints manned by soldiers in camouflage with machine guns strapped around their chests. At night, the television news would dub over the Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams' voice, which always seemed bizarre to me, even as a child. When I did hear his voice several years later, it was something of a disappointment. I'd built him up in my head to sound like a less friendly Darth Vader. As it was, he had the air of a geography teacher unable to keep control of the troublemakers at the back of the class. I, meanwhile, spoke with a precise, received pronunciation English accent and stood out from the first day of school. I had been born in Epsom, in the comparative safety of suburban Surrey. Every year, the derby took place on the downs next to our house, and my mother would have a picnic, to which she would invite a large number of family friends. I once saw the legendary jockey Lester Piggott fall off his horse and watched him being stretched off, his face as white as plaster. I was struck by how small he was, even though I was pretty small myself back then. In Ireland, there were no picnics and no family friends. It was an isolating experience for all of us, but particularly for my mother, who did not have a job through which she could meet new people. My father had moved us for his work and was taking up a new position as a consultant surgeon at Atnagelvin Hospital in Derry. It was a place where he would treat a lot of kneecappings. I was aware of the civil unrest and accepted it in the way that one does as a child. It simply became a way of life. The monsters under my bed were replaced by visions of balaclava-clad terrorists and I got used to the checkout ladies in the supermarket asking us suspiciously if we were on holiday when we did the weekly shop. I hadn't realised then that what we were actually being asked was whether we were there in connection with the British Army but I do recall being scared that we'd be bombed by the IRA, to which my mother replied sensibly that my father treats people from both sides. That was true. He ministered to both loyalists and republicans. When a shattering bomb went off in Omar in 1998, he rushed to help. My father went on to operate in many war zones with the charity Médecins Sans Frontières, including Chechnya, Sierra Leone and Afghanistan. When, years later, I asked him which place had affected him most, he said Omer, and recounted in detail the scenes of carnage that he had witnessed. There were moments of absurdity amidst it all. For the first year or so, my family and I lived up the road from a village called Muff, I did not think to question this extraordinary name until many decades later, when my friend Cormac howled with laughter when I mentioned it. Muff, he guffawed. You might as well have lived somewhere called Vagina. The village was a few minutes' drive away from our house in the north of Ireland, and yet it was across the border in County Donegal, which was part of the south. My mother used to drive me and my sister to Muff for our Irish dancing lessons all part of an effort to help us belong. And it baffled me that an entirely different country existed down the road from us. It seemed so arbitrary, and of course, it was. I couldn't fathom, aged four, that it was all because of this map-drawn border that people were killing each other. The Irish dancing wasn't the only way our family tried to fit in. When we moved from near Muff, deeper into the countryside around Claudie, my father bought a donkey, a red and blue painted cart, and four sheep to keep in the raised hillock at the back of our house, which we called, without my knowing why, the Rath. The donkey, Bessie, soon spawned a foal, christened with dazzling imagination, Little Bess. We were better at naming the sheep, who were called things like Lamborghini and Lambarda. Each summer, my parents would heroically attempt to shear the sheep by hand using what looked to me like a huge pair of scissors. 
My sister and I were required to act as sheepdogs in order to round up the bleating animals, and we had varying degrees of success. For breeding season, rams would be borrowed from local farmers to impregnate our ladies. One of them dropped dead while on the job. We notified the farmer, and then my father dug a pit to bury the ram. The ram was heavy, and the only way my father could manoeuvre it into place was on its back, with its legs facing up to the sky. Mysteriously, when it came to replacing the earth, there was no longer enough of it to cover the ram in the pit, and his legs stuck out of the ground. For months, those legs poked out of the grass like spooky totem poles, and I learned to avoid that particular area. Periodically, the lambs too would disappear, and I never thought to question these sudden absences. It was only some time later that I put two and two together and realised that every time a lamb was removed from the wrath, more bags of meat would appear in the freezer. Is this lambkin? I would stutter at the Sunday lunch table, looking at a roast joint served up with potatoes and a jar of mint sauce. After a while, my parents started giving the sheep numbers so that I became less emotionally attached to them. I'm not sure it worked. To this day, I far prefer roast chicken. Since this was the pre-internet, pre-Netflix era, when we weren't herding sheep, my sister and I had to make our own entertainment. My idea of a good time was disappearing into the vast network of rhododendron bushes in our garden to read a Nancy Drew mystery, or playing by the River Fochen, which ran parallel to our house, and which, when uttered in a Northern Irish accent, sounded like an expletive. I papered the attic with cut-out magazine pages because I'd read somewhere that Anne Frank had done the same thing while hiding from the Nazis. I was oddly obsessed with the Second World War. Possibly, now that I think about it, it's because I was living in a place shaped by political conflict. For the most part, the terrorist attacks happened outside my immediate world. My primary school was a nice place with good teachers and children who seemed to accept me as I was. The troubles impinged on our consciousness in a way that was simultaneously familiar and abstract. Everyone seemed inured. In the 70s, when bombs and booby traps and gun battles were an almost daily occurrence in parts of the province, local doctors took to prescribing nerve tablets, and tranquilizer use was higher here than anywhere else in the UK. According to Patrick Radden Keefe's book, say nothing. Doctors found, paradoxically, that the people most prone to this type of anxiety were not the active combatants who were out on the street and had a sense of agency, but the women and children stuck sheltering behind closed doors. By the time I arrived, this traumatised numbness had evolved into a culture of silence. Words were used sparingly and often carried symbolic, historic importance. The closer city to where we lived was referred to as Londonderry on the road signs, but to use its full name in conversation was to make a political statement that you were pro-British. You had to refer to it as Derry or risk the consequences. No one told me this directly, but I absorbed the knowledge without it having to be said. Sometimes the silence was particularly acute. When the shopkeeper father of a boy in the class below me was machine gunned to death for selling his goods to the British Army, I can't remember any of us even mentioning it. I was aware of my parents speaking to each other in hushed, serious tones, and I became used to listening for what wasn't being said as much as I listened for what was. Mostly, I just got on with it and tried not to think too much of the things that scared me. But when I went to secondary school in Belfast, I became more aware of my difference. I was a weekly boarder there, and one weekend, as I walked to the coach stop to catch the bus home, my route took me through the aftermath of a bomb attack the previous night. I passed the hulk of a blasted car, the metal warped beyond recognition. Every single window of the Europa Hotel had been blasted out. A confetti scattering of glass 
crunched under my feet. In those days, to speak with an English accent was, in certain quarters, to be marked out as the hated occupier. I was aware of this and tried not to talk too much when meeting new people or when I found myself in unfamiliar locations. But at school, I had to talk. At school, there was nowhere to hide. I had no notion of my own alien nerdishness until, shatteringly, at the beginning of my second year in secondary school, I was told a boy in my ear didn't fancy me because she's English. He wasn't even a particularly attractive specimen. I didn't fancy him because he had a ruddy complexion and always smelled vaguely of uncooked sausages. Still, his rejection cut me to the core. Overnight, I started seeing myself through other people's eyes. My fluorescent orange rucksack, which I wore on both shoulders, was not the last word in style. Corduroy trousers had never been cool. My accent was so noticeably foreign as to be actively off-putting to boys who smelled of sausage meat. My hair was flat rather than curly like Charlene's in Neighbours, and I didn't own crimpers, and my mother wouldn't let me get a perm. In fact, my mother still cut my hair, which wasn't exactly helpful either. To add insult to injury, I'd also been put up a year, which meant I was the youngest in my class by a considerable margin. But worst of all, I was English. I began to notice that the girls I thought of as my friends were talking about me rather than with me. They would make plans that didn't involve me to go to nightclubs with fake laminated IDs. I would hear them in groups laughing loudly, and when I approached, the laughter would mysteriously stop, like wind dropping from a sail. But because I was so accustomed to the constant shifting tension between said and unsaid, I didn't think to question it. I simply accepted it. I became used to not belonging. It all came to a head in the week we had our school photographs taken. Those embarrassingly awkward portraits that are all blazers, uneasy forced smiles and wary adolescent eyes. My photograph was a particularly good example. I had wonky teeth, ears that stuck out through the limp shoulder-length hair that my mother still cut. I was grinning dementedly at the camera, sitting with one shoulder angled towards the lens as the photographer had demanded. My blazer sleeves were too long for me and hung over my hands because my mother, as well as believing I should always have short hair, also believed there was no point in investing in a uniform that actually fitted when one could purchase clothes with substantial growing room. It was as I was walking down the busy school corridor on my way to double history with Mrs O'Hare that I saw it. The most popular girl in my year, let's call her Siobhan, was in fits of giggles. She was looking at a piece of paper in her hand and then passing it around a group of willing acolytes, each of whom in turn glanced at it and then laughed riotously. Siobhan said something in a low whisper, cupping her hand against her mouth. More giggling. Then she saw me staring at her and caught my eye. We were just looking at your photo, she sniggered. You look, snigger, really, snigger, pretty. There was an outburst of laughter. Even I knew I didn't look pretty. My eyes prickled with tears. Hold them back, I told myself. Pretend you don't care. But of course, I did care. I cared terribly. As a 12-year-old, my need to camouflage myself by belonging was at its most pressing. I didn't want to stand out. I wasn't sure enough of myself yet to risk forming a new teenage identity of my own, and until I figured that out, I simply wanted to be one of them. That was the moment it dawned on me. I was the school joke. I didn't fit in, and I never had. I was the weird, ugly English girl with bad clothes. I felt stupid, as if I'd perpetrated this big lie on my own unconscious. I'd been fooling myself up to that point that I was like all the other normal kids. I had stupidly thought that the qualities my parents and sister valued, 
a sense of humour, strong opinions, a slightly eccentric love of the archers, would transfer seamlessly into a different environment. But teenagers are unforgiving of difference. Plus, there's a thin line between strong opinions and shameless precocity, isn't there? I was probably unbearable. It's so interesting what your mind chooses to fix on. Lots of other things happened during that period that were probably, in their own way, far more upsetting. My mother recently told me that I had once kneeled down in the middle of the road, arms held aloft like a wailing penitent, crying and begging her not to take me to school. I had completely forgotten this, but when she spoke about it, glimmers of memory came back to me, and I remembered the sensation of gravelly tarmac against my knees. Yet it was Siobhan's reaction to my photograph that stuck with me, and although it would have been in any other context a passing, thoughtless comment, it became in my mind's eye definitive proof that I was not good enough. Worse, I knew that the source of my difference and my shame was my real self, the self I had been brought up to believe would be accepted on its own merits. My parents encouraged my enthusiasms and my individuality. At school, I learned too late that my strength of character was perceived as oddness, and from that moment on, my sense of self started to disintegrate. I wanted to change and to blend in, and yet I had no idea how to pretend to be someone else. In fact, there seemed to me to be something fundamentally dishonest about even attempting it. I was living in a society where there were so many different versions of the truth and where danger lay in the silent, shifting gaps between these truths that at the same time as wanting to fit in, I also had an innate desire to hold on to the one thing I knew was me. My voice. I was a conflicted, unhappy mess. I started to talk less at school. I stopped putting my hand up to answer questions. If no one heard my Englishness, I thought, then maybe they'd unsee my difference. During the days, I kept myself to myself and trudged long corridors with lever arch files clasped to my chest, hunched inwards. I sat at the back of the classroom, defacing my books with tipex, fighting my natural inclination to work hard because I knew now this marked me out as weird. I started cheating in tests, sneaking in scraps of paper with the answers on them and propping them up inside my pencil case. I did the bare minimum. It was a big school, and during the days, I was able to lose myself quite effectively amid the blue and grey uniformed mass. At nights in the shared dormitories of the girls' boarding house, I took down the posters I'd blue-tacked of fluffy seals, too babyish, and striking Calvin Klein adverts, if they had a woman in them, I was called gay by the other girls, and replaced them with black and white male Levi's models and pop stars. At weekends, I wasn't allowed to leave until Saturday morning when I got the coach back home. The journey took 90 minutes. When my mother picked me up from the stop, my shoulders would drop with relief that I could be myself again. But I only had one night of grace because we were required to be back early on Sunday evening for a chapel service. My mother would give me dinner, making my favourite things, and I'd have a lump in my throat as I ate, and I would try not to cry. I dreaded returning to school, and my way of coping was to seek comfort in the rare pockets of the familiar. I brought food from home. I read books and cherished the ability to lose myself in a different world. When I cried, I did so in private, behind a locked lavatory door. And as time went on, I did make a couple of friends, who were, like me, social outcasts. My grades spiralled downwards. I failed exams, once getting 47% in a chemistry exam. A shame so acute it haunts me still, three decades later. I developed two distinct personalities, a home self and a school self, and I went to great pains to ensure that the two never coincided. 
I never invited anyone back to mine at the weekends. I didn't tell my parents a lot of what was going on because I wasn't sure I fully had a grip on it myself. I just knew I was unhappy. It was to set in motion a coping mechanism that would last into my adult life and cause me a great deal of heartache. It was an internal dislocation, which meant I could distance myself from the pain of my sadness and put it to one side, like a washed-up dish left to dry in its own time, while I continued to exist and function seemingly effectively. But the detachment from my own hurt meant I gradually lost touch with what I was actually feeling, which meant that this became difficult to express. I, who had so many words, could not find the right ones when it came to myself. At the same time, I was desperate to please others in the hope that, by doing so, I would finally be granted the secret access code to belonging. So I shaded my character according to the company I found myself in. I would pretend to like pop stars and clothes and television programmes I didn't much care for, all the while clinging onto my English accent like a life raft that could still carry my disparate selves back to the actual me. I felt fury and guilt at what I conceived of as deception. And I turned these emotions inward and worried all the time about the myriad things I was doing wrong. Eventually it got to the stage where I point-blank refused to go back to school. My mother pleaded with me to finish the term, but I couldn't. I had reached the point where I had no emotional energy left, and in the end my parents agreed to take me out halfway through my third year. During the time that followed, I got a scholarship to a boarding school in England where no one thought my accent was exceptional. That September... I went back into the year I was meant to be in. The school was single sex rather than co-ed, which I found less intimidating. I had also learned some valuable lessons about how to be popular from my earlier experiences. I knew to stand back a bit and take stock, to be cautious about revealing myself too quickly for who I really was. I needed to suss out the other girls first, and assess the group dynamic before making my move. So it was that, age 13, I approached my first day as a new girl with Machiavellian intent. My strategy was simple. I would identify the most popular girl in my year and I would befriend her. I would observe the way she dressed and spoke and what she did with her hair. Then I would copy it. This I did. It worked like a dream. It was, in some respects, relatively straightforward and a matter of acquiring and doing the right sort of things. I bought River Island black hipster trousers. I said I fancied Robbie Williams from Take That. I drank Cinzano straight from the bottle on a park bench because you had to get drunk to be cool. I had a boyfriend in my final year and went to the Algarve with a group of friends to celebrate the end of our A-levels. It was the first time I'd ever stayed up to watch the sun rise. On the surface, at least, I appeared to belong. I was one of the cool ones. After my earlier failures, I was indubitably better at playing the game. I got good grades and made real friends. The teachers liked me. Still, I didn't much like school. I always felt resentful that I wasn't in control of my own life. I wanted, more than anything, to be an adult and in charge of my own existence. I was impatient to get on with things, to have a job, to live in my own flat and pay my own rent. In fact, I couldn't wait to leave. I had a growth spurt at the age of 14, and people frequently told me I seemed older than I was. It caused some confusion when I visited my sister at university. When we went out for a black tie dinner with some of her male postgraduate friends, I was keenly aware that I didn't want to embarrass her. I wore a black dress with white buttons all the way down the front. River Island again. I really did love that shop. Halfway through the Chinese meal, I was told that one of the men had taken a shine to me. He tried to strike up conversation across the table. 
I politely asked what degree he was taking, and after a few moments of chit-chat, he said, So what are you up to at the moment? I'm in the first year of studying for my GCSEs, I replied. His lower lip trembled as if he'd been punched. No more conversation was forthcoming. I suppose what I'm getting at is that one way or the other, I never entirely fitted in. I was immature in some ways, horrifyingly unworldly, and overly mature in others. I asked for a three-quarter length camel coat for my 18th birthday. Adults assumed I was capable, because by now I was tall and good at exams and well-behaved in class, but really I was just trying to work things out, and I still barely knew myself. I always felt something of an outsider. In Ireland, because I spoke like a foreigner. In England, because I hadn't grown up there. But this social failure at school had some positive byproducts. At an early age, it made me into an observer of human behaviour. I started to listen more than I talked. It's a skill that has been incredibly useful as a writer. And because I wasn't born cool but had to learn how to fake it, I like to think I have a degree of empathy for others who have never felt they belonged. When it came to writing my fourth novel, The Party, I mined my own experiences of being a scholarship kid on their first day in an unfamiliar environment for my protagonist, Martin Gilmore. I have often been asked at literary festivals how I imagined myself into the character of a misfit teenage boy, and the truth is, I based it on what I felt at the time. The emotions were so vivid to me that I can feel them still. Although it's worth pointing out here that Martin is a borderline sociopath who inveigles his way into his best friend's life with disastrous consequences. That's where any similarity between him and me ends. It's interesting how many of the successful people I've interviewed, both for the podcast and as a journalist, have felt a similar sense of alienation at school. I found that a surprising number of performers, specifically comedians, had parents in the military and therefore moved around a lot as children. They got used to adapting to new environments, and often the easiest way to make friends was to crack jokes or act the class clown. It's not a giant leap to think that this was what shaped their talent for performance. Jennifer Saunders, Dawn French, Adrian Edmondson, Jessica Alba and Christina Aguilera all came from military families. There's a sense, too, in which not being able to fit in makes you cultivate independence and resilience. If you move around a lot, you become used to making the most of your own company. If you're like me, you lose yourself in stories and imagination and create rich internal worlds to counterbalance the external complexities. When I interviewed Clint Eastwood in 2008, he recalled his own itinerant childhood as his father, a steel worker, travelled up the west coast of America looking for work in the 1930s. It was kind of lonely in some ways because you never went to the same school for six or seven months. You were always moving on somewhere, Eastwood said. The rap star Wiz Khalifa, too, was a military brat. I spoke to him about it for Elle magazine in 2015. We met in a classic Los Angeles hip-hop pad, all white walls and clean angles and heavy clouds of weed obscuring the view of the Hollywood Hills beyond. And he told me he moved bases every couple of years to Germany, the UK and Japan. Always being the new nerdy kid at school made him nervous, so music was his refuge. Seeing everybody else being confident and knowing everybody and me just kind of coming from the outside, it wasn't comfortable at all, he said. But doing my music, it was just my way of being the best at what I was interested in. He later turned his music into a chart-topping career and a net worth of $45 million. But it wasn't just the army kids who struggled to fit in. The novelist Sebastian Folkes told me he loathed the boarding school he was sent to at the age of eight. Later, he went to Wellington College, which he disliked intensely. 
Well, it was traumatic, undoubtedly, because the world that you found yourself in was it just bore no relation to any world I'd ever known. Iron bedsteads, weird clothes, weird food, Latin, Greek, hymns, and there was no experience for the first sort of month that I'd ever had before. But eventually you sort of got used to it. And I remember one term I didn't go home at all because there was some sort of mumps outbreak. And in some ways it was easier not to go home at all, actually. And, you know, I learned to fit in and to adapt. The actress Christina Hendricks, who starred as Joan in the hit series Mad Men, was bullied at school. When I interviewed her for The Observer in 2014, she told me her parents had moved from Idaho to Virginia because of her father's job when she was 13. She hated her new high school and felt uprooted and resentful. She wore Birkenstocks and hippie dresses. She was surprised when she saw the other girls her age at her new school carrying purses. I was like, ooh, purses. To me, only moms had purses. They were much more sophisticated and they were having sex and wearing makeup, all these things that had not happened for me. From the start, Hendrix was singled out. We had a locker bay, and every time I went down there to get books out of my locker, people would sit on top and spit at me. So I had to have my locker moved because I couldn't go in there. I felt scared in high school. It was like Lord of the Flies. There was always some kid getting pummeled and people cheering. Hendrix found her tribe in the drama department. Acting provided an outlet for a feeling of impotent rage. She became a goth, dyeing her hair black and purple, shaving it at the back, and wearing leather jackets and knee-high Doc Martin boots. She said her clothes, and her capacity for reinvention, provided a type of armour against what she was experiencing. My parents would say, you're just alienating everyone. You'll never make any friends looking like that. And I would say, I don't want those people to be my friends. I'm never going to be friends with the people who beat up a kid while everyone is cheering them on. I hate them. Of course, we know now how the story turned out. Hendrix's passion for drama turned into a successful career, winning her critical plaudits, Emmy nominations and the slavering admiration of a legion of borderline obsessive fans. That, it seems, is what connects all these stories. The lesson that, in order to survive, one needs either to adapt to a potentially hostile environment, or to redirect one's pain into a more positive and often creative outlet. It strikes me that school is not simply a place where academic lessons are taught, but also a place where we educate ourselves on who we are, where we can try out different identities and see what fits before the constraints and responsibilities of adulthood are upon us. I was always so frustrated as a teenager when condescending grown-ups would tell me that school days were the best days of my life and that I should make the most of them while you can. At the time, I wondered whether it was one of those things I might grow into believing in the same way as I grew into French cinema and liking pesto. But I never have. School days were categorically not the best days of my life. And in fact, I still have nightmares about them. On the podcast, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, creator of the BAFTA-winning Fleabag, spoke about the duality she felt at school. At home, she had been raised to be strong-minded and to test unnecessary boundaries, And yet, she was entering a place where rules had to be obeyed. I remember my mum saying to me when I first went to secondary school, she said, she was like, just be an angel for the first three terms. If you are an angel for the first three terms, you'll get away with anything you want for the rest of your school career. And uh, I really took that to heart. And I was, and I made sure, like, I worked hard, I got the, I don't know, little, like, badges or whatever you got, but the whole time just basically saying to my mates... If I nail this, then I can, you know, take anyone down later. And it was so true because then I just had the reputation of being a hardworking student. And I was a massive practical joker. And the cheekiness that also my mother had bred in me was brilliantly offset by the lesson to, like, appear to be a good girl and then you'll get away with being a bad girl. Of course, it was this duality that Wallabridge later deployed to great effect in Fleabag, where the protagonist is, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly nice, well-brought-up, middle-class girl 
who is actually grappling with darker issues of grief and abandonment, and who uses sex as distraction from having to deal with her own inadequacies. Within that premise lies a further duality, because although Fleabag ultimately addresses serious themes, it is also unabashedly funny. Failure to fit in at an early age teaches us to develop a resilience that can ultimately help us flourish. The political campaigner Gina Miller found this to be the case when she was sent from her home in Guyana to boarding school in Eastbourne at the age of 11. She was targeted by bullies for looking different and for the way she spoke. Before leaving home, Miller had taken a bottle of her mother's L'Air du Temps perfume with her to remind her of all the things she loved. Every night before going to sleep in her dormitory bed, Miller would dab a bit of the scent on her pillow before another girl spotted what she was doing and tipped the perfume down the toilet. When she discovered what had happened, Miller shed a few private tears before assessing her options. She could tell on the bully, which would alienate her from the other girls. She could suffer in silence, which might make her seem like a pushover. Or she could try and win the bully over. Miller went for the last option, giving the girl in question a bracelet as a peace offering. As soon as I reached out to the girl who was bullying me, her defences crumbled, Miller recalled. I didn't counter anger with anger, nor did I show I was upset. Instead, I tried to disarm her with kindness so that we could engage with each other. Once a bully sees you as human, that's half the battle. She added, All of this taught me an important lesson. It was that most bullies act from a place of weakness. They feel threatened and backed into a corner by something or someone they don't understand. Bullying is the way they lash out. But underneath all that bravado, there's often a fragile individual, riven with insecurities and weakness, who doesn't know how to express him or herself when confronted by the unknown. It was a lesson that she took with her into adulthood, when Miller found herself the target of death threats and racist abuse after successfully taking the UK government to court in 2017 over the triggering of Article 50 to exit the European Union without parliamentary consent. So what do we learn from failing to fit in? We learn how to cope with social rejection. We learn how to entertain ourselves. We learn independence and empathy, and we put our imagination to better use than we might have done otherwise. We learn how to handle bullies and people who don't like us. We learn strategies that help us acclimatise to new environments. We learn to code switch between different social languages. We learn not to let our mother cut our hair beyond an appropriate point. But my failure to fit in also had less positive effects. It made me, at an early age, into a people pleaser. I wanted others to like me and accept me, and the coping strategy I had developed to survive was predicated almost entirely on their good opinion. I wasn't particularly selective about who liked me. I just hankered after safety in numbers, which meant that for years I flailed around trying to fit in anywhere I could. It was an exhausting way to live, it meant I lost touch with a lot of what I was actually feeling and what I truly wanted in an attempt to contort myself around other people's desires. This became so embedded in my psyche that I didn't even know it was happening until I turned 36 and realised the existential corner I had painted myself into was diametrically opposed to my long-term well-being and my life imploded in spectacular fashion. I wonder how different I would have been had I adopted Christina Hendricks's fuck you attitude if, instead of unthinkingly going along with the herd, I had developed a strong individual identity and found refuge in difference rather than being scared by it. Perhaps I would have had a less critical internal narrative, that judgmental voice which kept telling me I was wrong or bad or not good enough throughout my teens and twenties. But maybe that voice was also part of my drive and ambition. I was seeking to prove to myself, through the frantic ticking of external boxes, degree, career, professional success, that I was all right, that I did have stuff to offer, 
that I was worth being friends with, that I was worth being loved. So I don't think, looking back, that I could have had the one without the other. I wouldn't have the published books, the journalism awards, the joy of seeing my name in print, without a borderline obsessive work ethic fuelled by outsidership. And maybe I wouldn't have such a wonderful circle of dear friends had I not also acquired the certain knowledge that acceptance is a fragile and fickle thing and isn't to be taken for granted. That you need to look after your friendships as you would your own health. I never did pick up an Irish accent. But when I wrote my first novel, my publisher found out I'd grown up outside Derry and I went back to Ireland to promote it. By then, the 1998 Good Friday Agreement had brought peace to the province and I was struck by how much lighter the atmosphere felt. In Derry, there were new buildings and shopping centres and a bridge that arced over the width of the River Foyle. In Belfast, I was interviewed by newspaper journalists and radio presenters who wanted to know about my school days and which other Irish writers I most admired. When the pieces were published or when the programmes aired, I was always introduced as a local novelist. I was welcomed everywhere I went, by people who bought me pints of Guinness and who showed demonstrable pride in me. After all those years, it didn't matter to them how I spoke. It was the most amazing feeling. What did it feel like? It felt like coming home. <laughs>